Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today um, for this installment of the Mesmer Research Group guest speaker series. Today, we have Dr. Byrak from Stevens Institute of Technology, and he will be discussing exploring the boundaries of human AI collaboration, a case study on StarCraft II. So with that, I will hand it over to him. Um, if you can, please hold your questions till the end um, or drop them in the chat and we'll get to them um, when his presentation is finished. Go ahead, Dr. Byrak. Thank you, Amelia. Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, um, Dr. Brian Mesmer for inviting me here. It's a great pleasure to present my work um, to such a great audience. I also want to thank Amelia uh, specifically. So she's been handling all the logistics very smoothly and she's done a pretty good job so far. So uh, in this talk, um, I would like to discuss um, human AI collaboration and uh, design and systems engineering. And I wanna talk um, about the boundaries that I'm exploring uh, in that domain. So I'm gonna present my work on a case study on the video game StarCraft II. Uh, before that, I wanna say a few words about myself. Um, so I did my bachelor's in mechatronics engineering um, in 2011 um, in Sabah University in Istanbul. Um, then I did my master's and PhD in mechanical engineering at the University of Michigan. And I spent about three years over there as a postdoctoral research fellow. Um, after which I moved to Carnegie Mellon University um, as a research scientist um, in Pittsburgh. Um, I spent about a year um, in um, Dr. John Kagan's group. Over there, I started working on human AI collaboration. And part of my talk today will be based on my work over there. Um, and after that, I moved to Stevens Institute of Technology as an assistant professor in 2019. And since then here, I've been doing work in human AI collaboration in design and systems engineering. And um, I've been teaching courses on statistics and mainly systems engineering and operations research. Um, uh, a little bit more background on what I do in my research. So back in Michigan, I used to work on the um, optimal design of active system architectures. So active systems are uh, systems that require a control policy uh, to sense what's happening in their environment and respond to uh, the changes and inputs uh, um, in the environment. So examples are uh, things like hybrid powertrains, uh, where you know they have to decide whether to use engine or motor based on the, the demand from the driver and uh, road conditions. Um, also, um, another example is a modular vehicle design that we explored for Department of Defense. And these were um, reconfigurable vehicles and they had to be reconfigured based on the demand at the particular time. So um, our work involved designing these systems optimally. And the issue is that these problems are so complex that cannot be formulated as a single optimization problem um, at, a, at a single level. So what we ended up doing was to decompose that problem into smaller subproblems and uh, formulated ways to coordinate the solution of these individual subproblems to find consistent solutions. Uh, so as these problems are very difficult to solve, just using mathematical tools we have, we decided to explore what we can leverage uh, from human intuition. So for that, we have used video games where we could get uh, uh, human players involved in a design and control problem. And we collected some data from them. And by looking at their data, we wanted to see whether we could learn some intuitions that they develop and integrate those uh, uh, intuitive problem solving skills into uh, computational methods. Um, and for that, we have developed this eco racer game that you can see on the screen. Right now, the web page for that is down, but I'm planning to um, make it active again. But over here, people were driving uh, an electric vehicle and designing a simple uh, final drive ratio in that uh, problem. And uh, based on the data that we collected, we have found out that some people do a very good job in that game and some people don't. Uh, but we thought that people who don't do a good job, they still have some intuition, so they still provide some useful input. Um, uh, some of them were able to finish the track. Uh, however, their design were not so good. So we, we combine all the data from good and bad players and uh, train a computer algorithm uh, that could learn some useful heuristics from people. And we found out that the heuristics 
could really improve the, the um, uh, solution time and solution quality of these computer algorithms. So given that sort of research journey, I see my early work as uh, basically the, the uh, collaboration between computer algorithms uh, um, and solving a, a problem by using existing computational tools and coordinating their communication. And my work with EcoRacer, I consider that as basically leveraging some human input to support computer algorithms. So in this talk, I'm gonna do the, the inverse of that. So I'm gonna talk about how we could develop computer algorithms, uh, artificial intelligence systems to support humans. And I'm gonna talk about that in an application case of StarCraft. And my ultimate goal is to basically develop systems where uh, uh, um, we can learn from humans and we could support humans. So we could do that in real time. So this is my final goal. So I haven't uh, got there yet, but I'm hoping to basically combine what I have done so far uh, uh, to achieve that goal. So let's talk a little bit about human AI collaboration. Uh, uh, why it's an important uh, problem and where we can use it. Um, Normally, I have been talking about human intuition as a useful tool to leverage, but there are also a lot of things that we cannot do as human beings, for example, processing a large amount of data. So we have uh, a limited cognitive capacity. We learn fast, but uh, we cannot process a lot of information. Uh, so the machine learning tools that uh, are recently gaining more and more popularity, um, they are very good at that. So they could identify certain patterns in the data and they could connect them together and you know, identify really uh, useful heuristics in the data. However, they lack the intuitive thinking. So when they propose say a solution or a, a design, they don't know whether that makes sense or not. So they just propose that based on uh, uh, certain correlations and relationships in the data. Um, so we need human to um, augment that and uh, do a sanity check in that sense to provide this intuitive thinking. So if you combine these two together, they have big strengths and weaknesses. So I believe that we can achieve bigger things uh, compared to what we can do alone and what AI can do alone. Application areas are um, several. So um, the, the most obvious one is the uh, defense domain. So you can imagine smart defense systems where soldiers can work with intelligent systems, gain some uh, uh, intel from them, or they can be used to complete certain tasks, but they can work together to accomplish a common goal. Uh, on the civilian domain, we can think about autonomous transportation, for example. So I'm not talking about just individual vehicle level, but at the system level where uh, vehicles need to operate together to achieve a common goal. Say, think about uh, a company like Uber, who has many vehicles, uh, imagine if they were autonomous, they need to operate together. However, um, uh, the operation of these vehicles at the vehicle level can be done autonomously, but maybe the management of the system can be done by a human being to basically identify which vehicle should uh, take which passenger and so on. Um, um, another application could be smart, smart healthcare, where we could use AI systems to suggest some uh, um, diagnosis decisions to users like doctors. Um, however, we need doctors to make the final call because we cannot just leave human lives to AI systems because they are not perfect. So um, even the most accurate uh, diagnosis systems have an accuracy of like 85 to 90 percent, but that 10 that percent in life critical application is very, very important. But I believe that we can combine human in intuition with these systems to achieve uh, uh, much bigger things like accurate diagnosis and much faster diagnosis and so on. Uh, this problem is not new though. I'm gonna give you a little bit of a history lesson if I may, uh, to talk about you know, how we got here today. The, the collaboration between humans and machines have been studied since 1950s. So um, if you dig the literature a little bit, uh, you can find works uh, uh, from uh, Dr. Paul Fitz. So he was the first person who come up with a list of things that human could do better compared to machines and a list of things that machines could do better than humans. 
And back in the day, uh, you know, computers were very primitive, uh, but still some of the ideas are still applicable today. Like uh, uh, in that list, if you uh, look uh, on the left, uh, uh, Dr. Fitz said, you know, humans are good at detection, perception, judgment, induction, improvisation, and long-term memory, whereas computers were better at speed, power, computation, replication, simultaneous operations, and short-term memory. So this list has survived for a very long time. Even though people criticized that list, they said it's not accurate, it still guided a lot of work on how we should allocate a uh, task between humans and machines. So for a long time, people have studied how we could develop automation systems for human use. Here I specifically call it automation uh, as opposed to autonomous or intelligent systems. So these systems were basically static systems where there is a fixed algorithm to accomplish certain tasks. And mainly people left you know, repetitive tasks to automation systems. They were not learning anything from their environment. So they were just simply following a given script based on if it rules or based on the solution of an optimization problem defined a priori. Uh, today, we are talking about a different kind of intelligence system, right? So these systems are adaptive. They could learn from data or humans and uh, they are more than a tool. So they can accomplish things that we cannot accomplish. And I believe that we can use it as a team member as opposed to just a, just a simple tool. Uh, just to give you an example of what you know, modern AI systems can do, I have recently seen that uh, news article where an AI completed an, an, an unfinished work from uh, Beethoven. So I give a link here, uh, and if you just go to that link, it goes to a YouTube video uh, where you know, people um, used uh, Beethoven's uh, a part of his work and some of his notes and trained an AI based on his prior work to complete the gaps. And if you listen to the video, you won't be able to identify where uh, AI's work kicks in. So they have tested with a bunch of experts and they were not able to identify. So in this particular example, this AI wasn't designed to work with people. It was designed for a particular task, but it accomplished something creative. So it's not just a mere tool anymore. So we could maybe use the same idea to compose more creative work uh, in combination uh, with humans. So in this talk, I'm going to ask that question. If you wanted to design an AI to specifically work with humans, what can we do? Uh, normally, as I mentioned, AI systems are designed to solve a predefined problem. They have a goal to maximize accuracy or performance, uh, and they adopt the notion of AI as a tool. But we can design an AI to take a feedback from human beings and um, adapt their decisions based on that. Maybe, maybe when we work with an AI, the AI can adjust its own decision-making based on what we prefer or what we like. If you don't account for that, if you just consider AI as a tool, it may not be very useful. For example, if the suggestions or if the decisions from the AI does not align with what we're going to do, or if you don't understand what AI does behind the scenes, maybe we won't trust AI. So therefore, we have to think about what human user needs or wants when you would like to design AI to work with humans. So in this talk, I'm going to narrow down the scope a little bit and focus on a particular type of problem. So we have looked at that problem to, to develop an AI to work with uh, humans or support humans. And our motivation was basically the problems that we face uh, in, in defense systems. So imagine that a bunch of soldiers would like to work with an AI to make decisions over time. And there might be some adversary who might wanna do pretty much the same thing. So they might have the intelligence systems too. Uh, or on the civilian domain, you can consider a company like Uber who operates a, a set of um, uh, autonomous vehicles. And there might be a competitor like Lyft who has pretty much similar uh, fleet and they are trying to solve the same problem too. So what's common in these two problems is that a bunch of decisions must be made over time. And there is a competition against an opponent. It's a little bit different from games like chess, right? So if, if you think about how chess works, you make a decision and you wait for the opponent to make another decision. So it's a turn-based system. But in these examples, if you don't make a decision, the system keeps evolving over time. So it's a dynamic system uh, and the evolution 
can be affected by your decision, but it's sort of independent from what you do. So it, the time is running in continuous domain. So it's in that sense, a little different from classical game theoretic problems. So here we use game theory, but we also apply controls techniques to formulate a, a problem in the continuous domain. And we apply some machine learning tools to develop an AI to solve a problem like that to support a human being. And we apply that problem on um, the video game StarCraft. Even though StarCraft is not the, the, the uh, problems that motivated that work, it still defines a, a rich set of uh, decisions. And uh, the problem that we solve in StarCraft is still similar in complexity to those that we can face in real life. Even though it's a game environment, but it provides a nice uh, um, uh, engine for us to uh, test and develop our AI on. So for those who don't know what StarCraft is, I have a video to show in the next slide, but it's basically a real-time strategy game where uh, you need to def defeat an opponent by training an army. And that army is trained based on the resources that you gather. So for those, you need to uh, uh, create some workers. And once you develop an army uh, consisting of a variety of soldiers who have different strengths and weaknesses, you need to go and defeat the opponent's base. And while doing so, you need to think about what opponent is going to do so that you can develop the right army to counter the opponent's strategy. So here's a video to describe what the game does very briefly. Commander, requested information follows. The strategic options in StarCraft II are endless, but the fundamental gameplay mechanics are simple. Gather resources, assemble your forces, and defeat your opponents. You will begin each match with a simple base and a limited number of workers. Use workers to gather resources. Resources are needed to expand your base and to train combat units. To overcome your adversaries, it will be necessary to assemble a formidable military force. Developing a strong economy will help you fuel the needs of your growing army. Each race, Terran, Protoss, and Zerg, has access to a variety of units, each with a set of special abilities that will allow it to fill a specific role on the battlefield. For example, the Terran's Vikings are capable of transforming from assault walkers to air superiority fighters, granting them unparalleled mobility. The towering Protoss Colossus excels at traversing steep elevations with ease and devastating opposing ground forces. Zerg infestors may control the minds of their enemies, turning opponents' units against each other. Every unit in StarCraft II is completely unique and suited to a specific task. Combining different units to form versatile armies is the key to victory. Victory is achieved when your enemies surrender, or when a lost building is destroyed. As the leader of your army, it will be necessary to think on your feet, to adapt to an ever-changing battlefield, and to use your unit's abilities to turn the tide of battle in your favor. Good luck, Commander, and see you on the battlefield. So as you can see in this video, uh, there are so many decisions involved and there are so many things that you can do. It's a very dynamic environment. So if you don't do anything, you're going to lose because the opponent is keep doing something, right? So you're also running against time. So uh, to formulate problems like that, we borrow something from the literature and uh, we use differential games. Differential games are basically the application of game theory into dynamical systems. So if you combine game theory with controls, you get differential games. These problems are motivated by pursuit and evasion problems and they date back to 1965. So in this pursuit and evasion problem, imagine there's an aircraft and there's a missile following the aircraft. So what should aircraft do to um, uh, evade a crash? And what should the missile do to hit the aircraft? So if you think about it, this is also a game running in continuous time and you're also running against time to make a decision. So uh, in these problems, um, 
when when formulating these problems, so we need to identify a bunch of states which are dependent variable describing the state of the system, and a bunch of actions in continuous time determining what each of these actors can do in time. And these actions are states are dependent on each other through a, a series of dynamical set of equations. So here I show the most general form uh, as a nonlinear relationship. And uh, uh, the solution of these problems look for an equilibrium over a uh, time horizon. Over there, there is an objective function, which is a function of states and sometimes actions, where one of the actors is trying to maximize this function and the other actor is trying to minimize this function. Imagine that this function could be um, like the probability of hit. So one actor is trying to maximize the probability and the other actor is trying to minimize that probability. This is a very simple example to you know, um, describe the idea. So if we could formulate a problem like this and have these you know, nice objective functions and nice dynamical set of equations to describe everything about the system, that would be so nice. However, our problems are complex. So again, you know, borrowing a single theory to solve a simple problem is not gonna work in the real world. So um, we have to, basically deviate from the Occam's razor here and maybe uh, think about a more complex solution uh, because the simple problems don't serve to our purpose. And there are a few reasons for that. The first one is that in real world, the objective functions are not usually well defined. Say in a defense system, yes, your goal is to defeat an opponent, but how can you formulate that mathematically? It's not that easy. Uh, also, there are so many different decisions involved. Right. So um, uh, in case of StarCraft, you have seen that there are so many different possible soldiers. You have workers, you have so many possible buildings that you can construct and you can control the army in a variety of ways. So it's a very big problem. Uh, another, maybe the biggest problem is that there is no single solution to uh, to dominate the other solutions. So every strategy could be countered with something else. So there is not a single global solution that we look for, but we need to identify a variety of solutions, or maybe we need to identify a, a heuristic or a method to counter what opponent does, as opposed to uh, um, telling uh, the, the player to do one single thing. So um, after giving that preamble, so this is what we did in the case of StarCraft. So we combine a bunch of methods together to accomplish uh, um, the one single goal. Uh, and that goal is to develop an artificial intelligence system that could take feedback from the opponent player and suggest some strategy alternatives to a human player and keep doing that in real time based on what human does. So to do that, we stand from a bunch of gameplay data that exists in public domain. So this is another reason why we picked StarCraft. There is a bunch of uh, publicly available data that we can leverage from. So this data contains basically all the decisions from two players playing against each other and gives us the, the final um, um, game score, uh, basically telling us who won and who lost. Starting from that, to develop an artificial intelligence system, we need to represent the problem mathematically. And in a complex system, there might be different levels of abstractions that you can follow. So for example, the, the highest level of abstraction in a game like StarCraft could be staying in the defensive line or playing aggressively uh, for an offensive strategy or balancing these two, right? It could be just as abstract as that. But you know, if you go a little bit deeper, uh, you can identify at different levels of abstractions that could help you to formulate the problem mathematically. So in our case, we separated strategic decisions from operational ones. So you'll see what I mean by strategic decisions, but we formulate the problem in two levels. And our main focus is the strategic decisions in this problem, which you will see in a couple of slides. Another thing that we did was uh, to acknowledge the fact that there are many possible strategies uh, that are involved and none of them will be uh, dominating one. So therefore, we identify what are the possible strategies uh, that we have observed in um, the, the, the data set that we have, and we train different models for each strategy cluster. 
so that way, we are not assuming that there is one single solution, but we are assuming that there are solutions for each strategy cluster separately. And we are not claiming that one cluster is better than the other. So uh, after the clustering, we tried developing a, a, a machine learning system. But for that, first we need to represent the system dynamics where we identify a bunch of states in the game and a bunch of actions. And we need to link these states and actions through a series of dynamical equations. And after that, as I mentioned, there is no objective function defined in this problem. Uh, the only goal uh, given to you is to win the game. And what does it mean to win the game? So what do you need to do to win? So we use data to train a reward function telling us what actions are good or what states are good and what states are bad. Um, and then we combine all of them together in a differential game-based strategy. However, we realize that when we are starting the game with a differential game-based approach, the, the solutions that we have won't be meaningful. We realize that these strategies are more meaningful when you are somewhere in the middle of the game or toward the end. At the beginning, there is so much uncertainty involved regarding what your opponent is doing. What, people are basically following certain heuristics, just like in chess. You, you might have some opening that is independent from the reward that you have in mind. It's just based on your own preference. So we followed the same idea and said, okay, we can use differential game strategies in the middle, but at the beginning, we created some opening strategies that are sort of predefined and independent from what the opponent does. So you'll see each of these steps one by one. So let me start with the separation between strategic and operational decisions. So it's a commonly used approach in systems engineering and in management. Uh, uh, people usually separate strategic, tactical, and operational decisions. These are uh, different levels of decision-making. And uh, in our case, we have to do the same thing as well. The reason for that is that operational decisions are very detailed decisions, and they usually have lower levels of uncertainty and they have predefined goals. So whereas strategic decisions are more like long-term decision-making, and there is a huge amount of uncertainty. When you would like to handle these problems, you have to apply different mathematical techniques to solve these problems. So if you combine all of them together, it will be very difficult to formulate the problem. Another reason is that operational decisions mainly operate on well-defined variables. However, strategic decisions depend on these operational decisions. So you'll see an example of how we formulated the problem in StarCraft and you'll understand the difference between these two. In our approach, what we uh, did was we looked at the micromanagement of existing units and buildings as an operational decision making. So if you have a given army, uh, how you control that army is a micromanagement, and this is a very detailed operational level decision making. However, creating that army, basically investing on resources, investing on units, building upgrades, these are strategic decisions that have long-term impact. We call them strategic decision uh, making. And uh, these decisions are linked together. Uh, for example, how many units that you need to control depend on how many units that you train at the strategic level. Therefore, solving these problems together is going to be very challenging from a mathematical point of view. That's why separating them uh, made more sense. Our focus in this work is on the strategic decision making. Uh, and uh, in, in our architecture, we left the micromanagement of units to a human player. So we decided that maybe we could leverage AI's power uh, to suggest some strategies to a human player, assuming that human player can handle a given army. So uh, the strategic decisions that we identified were, again, uh, um, training certain number of units, uh, collecting certain number of resources, investing on certain number of buildings and upgrades for various types. So we have about like 100 variables that we identified at the strategic level. So uh, these decisions are considered as actions in our uh, state space representation. So creating X more soldiers is an action, uh, whereas how many soldiers you have is considered as a state. So um, some of the states are related to how many resources that you have, how many uh, uh, basic capacity, how much capacity you have to 
host an army and so on. So by using rules of the game, we can link these decisions to the current state. So we created the state space representation mainly based on the rules of the game, which is known to, to us uh, beforehand. And next, we need to train a model to describe what states are good and what states are bad. And for that, we have to leverage the data we have. As I mentioned, we apply some strategy clustering to identify different strategy clusters. And we believe that the reward function for each cluster will be different. So we use the cumulative decisions of all players and identify mainly five different clusters in a, a small data set that we use. And we train a different reward function to link states to, uh, um, to, to something like a probability of winning, which I will show you in the next slide. But before that, let me show you what kind of clusters that we have identified so you can see the, the variety of approaches that we have seen in the data set. So um, the, these are the five clusters and each uh, um, value in the horizontal axis represents a particular type of uh, uh, unit that they focus on. Uh, in cluster one, as you can see, the blue player, which is the winning player and red player, which is the losing player, um, the, somewhere in the middle of the game, I think this is up to the 50% game progression, they focused on basically training workers. So in the middle, nobody had a, a large army. So this is more like a, a gameplay where both players uh, follow a defensive strategy. So they wanted to uh, gather resources first so that they could train an army. In another cluster, somewhere in the middle of the game, you can see that there are some workers. However, they have trained Marines, which are an um, um, offensive unit. So as you can see, a significant portion of their uh, army is consisting of Marines, and there are some other types of armies that they have trained. So in cluster two, you can see more of an aggressive strategy. And the other clusters are sort of somewhere in the middle of these two. So what they want to achieve in cluster one is going to be different from what they want to achieve in cluster two. Therefore, we need to train separate reward functions to understand what they had in mind so that we can learn from them. So the way to train our reward function is as follows. So we have used what's called a long short-term memory network, which is basically a neural network trained designed for sequential decision-making. So it accounts for basically the relationship between uh, uh, the decisions that you make now and decisions that you made in the past. But it's not a very straightforward process because the data only tells us the, the final game score. So we know what happened at the end. So we know who won and who lost. And we also know that at the beginning, people start from the same uh, uh, game state. But we need to basically interpolate that function in between. So we denote that winning as a, a value equal to one and loss as a value equal to zero, uh, minus one. And we denoted the initial state of the gameplay with a value of zero. And we interpolated what happens in between using an exponential function. And we trained a neural network to map states to that exponential function. And here is a, a sample result from our training. So these uh, solid line is the actual value of the function. Blue lines are the winning players. Red lines are uh, the, the values of the losing players. Uh, we have added some synthetic data in this application. Normally, like there is no situation like a tie in StarCraft. But imagine if you do exactly the same thing that your opponent does, nobody should win. But unfortunately, gameplay forces you to just either win or lose the game. So to improve the accuracy, uh, um, we added synthetic data by copying the data and assume the players also play against each other. And we call these situations as a tie. And we train our function based on that. And as you can see, pretty much after 70% game progression, you can see who is going to win and who is going to lose clearly. But before that, um, it's not very uh, uh, clear. So anybody could win or lose. Our accuracy is pretty low in the early gameplay, which is expected. However, this function gives us a target to maximize or minimize. So next, uh, um, before jumping into the differential gameplay, so I want to talk a little bit about how we created the opening strategies. This is independent from the reward function that we train. We just identified you know, different strategies, and we looked at how they start the gameplay. So we extracted a bunch of heuristics from them. 
uh, and uh, we, we uh, provided these as a suggestion to a human player pretty much up to 50% of the gameplay. And then after that, we solve a differential game problem where we uh, try to uh, identify an equilibrium solution for uh, that problem, where one of the players is trying to minimize and the other player is trying to maximize that. And uh, uh, we formulated our um, gameplay rules and that served as a, a system dynamics in our case. And we identified a bunch of constraints to limit certain decisions. For example, if you want, maybe without these constraints, the problem will force you to create a, a very large number of soldiers, but you have very limited resources. So therefore, we create a bunch of constraints to limit certain decisions from happening. So the way to solve this problem is also tricky. Uh, so for that, we uh, went with the model predictive control approach. What it does is that it takes the dynamical system model and it solves a problem over a prediction horizon. What it does is that it identifies a bunch of actions uh, uh, that will uh, um, lead to a, a bunch of states that will sort of minimize uh, an objective function from a player two point of view, and that will maximize the objective function from player one point of view. And that gives us basically uh, a, an optimized set of states, assuming that our system dynamics model is perfect and everything works as uh, they should. But in reality, the actual evolution of state might be a little bit different from what we predicted. Uh, so what it does is that it basically moves the prediction horizon one step ahead and it solves exactly the same problem one more time using the actual state value. So we do that over a series of steps uh, until um, we, we uh, reach 200% game progression. So the way to solve the uh, Nash equilibrium problem is also um, based on an iterative approach. First, we fix the decisions of player one and we try to minimize that function for player two. And then for the optimal solution, we fix player two and solve the problem for player one. And we, we iterate that over until we achieve convergence, meaning the decisions of these two players uh, stop changing anymore. So here's a simple set of results. So I'm, I'm gonna sort of wrap up the computational side of it. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about human subject experiments. So um, here's an example of uh, an opening strategy that we have. So people start with a bunch of soldiers, SCV, sorry, workers. SCV is a worker. And the opening strategy basically asks players to keep increasing their number of uh, workers. And after say 20% game progression, and the, the opening strategy asks players to start training some soldiers so that they could have some, some defense available in case somebody attacks. And after 50% uh, the, uh, game progression, we switch to the game theoretic solutions. And over there, I think we, we do the switching after 40%, sorry. So over here, uh, here is uh, the, the results that we have found. So the dash line is the solution that we have obtained from uh, the, the game theoretic approach. In Y axis, you see the game score, which is the function that we trained. It is a function between zero and uh, one. And the solid line is what happened uh, in the actual data. So if you want to evaluate the human decisions with respect to the same function, this is what you would get. And here is some interesting set of uh, conclusions that we made. As you can see, the game theoretic approach leads to a lower score for winning players. And it leads to a higher score for losing players. So, which means that maybe, maybe game theory assumes a safe approach for winning players. So if you think about uh, how game theoretic formulations work, they assume that the opponent is rational. But if you think about a winning player, the, the opponent of a winning player is somebody who lost and that opponent may not be strictly rational. Therefore, the, strat the, the decisions of the game theory might be very conservative and that leads to a performance decrease. In case of a losing player, the assumptions of game theory works because the opponent of a losing player is a winning one and maybe that person is rational. And following game theory, you could improve your game score. Even though we cannot improve it much because at 80% game progression, the game is already set. So you can't do really much to make a, a losing play.
their win at that point. Um, so um, these are basically based on a purely computational approach. So we want to see whether this uh, uh, AI uh, that we train can be used in, in real world and see if it really helps players. Um, so what we did was as a next step to develop a human subject experiment in a StarCraft environment. And over here, uh, what we did was we designed an interface here that basically projects the uh, uh, suggestions from the AI to a human player. For example, the AI tells here, build one armory, train two siege tanks and so on. So these are basically the decisions that we obtained from the solution of the game theory uh, uh, that I presented before. So just to show you that, so we take a feedback from the opponent state and player state and so, uh, solve a game theory uh, problem and find the solutions, meaning the, the optimal actions that uh, we need to make. And we present them to a human player. And based on that uh, input, uh, we solve another problem and so on. So here is uh, how the, the uh, experiment works. Our goal is first to understand better, um, you know, it makes a difference to run the experiment between expert players or non-expert players. So as you have seen in the computational results, AI is not very good for winning players, but it's beneficial for losing players. So we want to see whether um, game theory suggestions improve human decision-making performance uh, and whether there's a difference between experts and non-experts. Also, everything depends on whether people follow the AI or not. So we wanted to see whether people follow and whether their expertise make a difference. So uh, in the experiment interface, we have first um, an experiment introduction and we design a tutorial here to show people what AI uh, does and how the suggestions work, assuming that they know a little bit about StarCraft. Um, and then uh, we ask them to play the game without any AI uh, suggestions. So we want to assess their skills and how they do on their own. So that also gives us a baseline and next, we ask them to play the game with AI. So there's an opening stage, which is not dependent on your decisions. So it's basically a predefined set of moves that you should make at the beginning. And then we move to the game theoretic stage after about four minutes or three minutes. I don't remember. I say four here, but I think we switch to game theory after minute three. And that is basically dependent on what you do and what opponent does. So we take basic observations from the state of the game and uh, query our AI, um, and it gives us the optimal set of actions that we need to take based on the solution there. So um, we have some preliminary findings which are not published, and these are the last set of things that I want to show. Um, so we first ran the experiment with expert players, and we have found out that uh, our results are as, as expected from the computational findings. AI does not improve their performance much actually doesn't improve it at all. So uh, um, based on our preliminary analysis, we found out that it takes longer for players to win the game with AI support. So when we ask them to play the game without AI, they win in a very short amount of time. Uh, most of them can finish the game in say minute six or seven. But with AI, it takes significantly longer for them to finish the game. Like some of them play until like minute 15 or 20. So, um, we believe that AI suggestions might be much safer than what they would normally do uh, if they played with their own style. And it's because of the game theoretic nature of the AI, because it assumes that opponent is rational and it assumes that to attack the player, you need to have the right set of army to win the game. However, if your opponent isn't that smart or if it isn't that good, then this might be very safe. But in, at the end of the day, they still win the game with AI support. So AI support doesn't make things bad, but just it's a little safe or uh, um, it, 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 it's a little bit conservative, I would say. So our next step is to run the experiment with noise players. And it is possible that AI support might be more beneficial for them uh, because they might not have a good set of heuristics established at that point. And maybe the safe suggestions from AI could be beneficial for them compared to what they would do on their own. So these are the, the uh, current state of where we are. 
in my own uh, research program, you know, I have the overarching goal to develop a set of principles for an AI to, um, that can effectively collaborate with humans. So my goal is to understand how we should design AIs so that we could uh, support human beings in the most efficient way. And a couple of problems here I'm focusing on are, for example, trust issues. So uh, maybe, maybe I should design the AI considering uh, whether humans will understand the suggestions, whether humans will like the suggestions. So, and that all will manifest itself uh, through trust in an intelligent system like that. So if I understand what the trust issues are, maybe I can incorporate them in their design process. Another thing is given a complex system, how can I divide the labor between human and AI, which is another big problem. So normally uh, in the past, we used to give like repetitive, dull, uh, you know, non-creative things to machines. But as I showed you in uh, the beginning of the presentation, AI can also do creative work. Maybe we could rethink what humans and AIs can do and start thinking about this division of labor problem from scratch. Also, how can we coordinate the decisions between human and AI? So um, uh, it's also another issue that I'm focusing on in my own research. So um, this is a, a work that was supported by DARPA. So I wanted to thank my uh, uh, funding agency for that. And this was done in collaboration with Carnegie Mellon University and Penn State. So I'd like to thank my collaborators over there as well. So with that, I would like to conclude my talk and uh, leave some room for Q&A. Awesome, thank you so much for that. That was very interesting. Um, now we will open the floor if anybody has any questions. Feel free to unmute yourselves and um, ask away. Uh, yeah, I've, I've got a couple questions. Um, so uh, a little bit of background. I uh, actually used to work in psychology and uh, cognitive decision theory and actually on some kind of similar stuff so I had some questions that I think you kind of uh, partially at least answered on the, the last slide, which was if this is uh, assuming that if the, the suggestions of these strategies here are assuming that the player will choose one of these strategies or assuming that these are just influencing the decision that the human makes, which isn't necessarily going to lead to the same suggestions, you know? Yeah. So um, over here, um, uh, that's a very important point. So when we develop this AI, we assume that people will follow these suggestions. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so if they don't follow, um, they will probably move to a different uh, game state, which will require a different series of actions. We account for, uh, you know, the, the issue of not following a little bit through some feedback that we have in the system. So say you provide some suggestions and player decided to do something else that leads to a different game state. And we still take feedback from that and provide a different set of suggestions. However, if players consistently not follow these suggestions in the long term, the AI will be useless, correct? Mm -hmm. So um, we need to make sure that some of these suggestions sort of are in line with what uh, people do. So it's one of the, the, the next things that we would like to study. However, surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, in our uh, uh, results so far, um, we have found out that people reasonably follow or try to follow the AI suggestion somehow if they can. Uh, maybe it's because it's an experimental setting and people yeah. sort of feel like they're pressured to follow. Yeah, so in, even though we- everyday life, maybe they wouldn't. You know. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So uh, this is the next thing. So we'll, since we have now an established infrastructure and we would like to sort of make sure that we leave enough flexibility for people to follow or not to follow and understand why they do or not to do uh, some of the things that we uh, suggest them to do. So uh, we, we would like to study those, those issues and incorporate that in our AI training as well. So we should probably leave some room for people not to follow that and uh, um, do the training accordingly. Yep. And then I had a kind of one other uh, point. If the, with the kind of uh, 
the performance gap between the human players and the the sort of predictions coming from the Nash equilibrium or, or whatever from the purely following the strategy. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know you were mentioning sort of the the impact of opponents and particularly losing opponents, maybe not being as rational and that causing some of you know maybe mm-hmm. suboptimal performance. But how much uh, it, could there also be just like ceiling and floor effects here that like compared to a, a really good expert player, it's a whole lot easier to come up with worse strategies than it is to come up with better strategies, you know? And like, is that something that's an element here or? So right now in, in game theoretic approach, it's, it's very difficult to account for, um, um, you know, the, the skill set of the opponent Mm-hmm. And also, um, once you have a series of suggestions, it's difficult to uh, make it better or worse without knowing what the objective function looks like, right? So mm-hmm. it's it's a you know machine learning model. We don't understand what's going on uh, behind the scenes. So instead, uh, we are sort of deviating from the game theory approach. So with with another colleague, I'm looking at a problem where I skipped that part briefly, but instead of uh, uh, training the opponent considering a a game theoretic model, maybe we could build a behavioral model where we could predict what opponent can do. uh, And then based on that, maybe we could adjust our strategy. So in that sense, uh, we could uh, improve the model even for the winning players so that if their opponent is bad, we could account for that information of decision-making. But for that, we need to train a behavioral model that will predict what opponent will do. So we're currently working on it and we have some promising results over there, but we haven't done the comparison with the game theory yet. So we are going there. Uh, Cool, thank you. Thank you for asking. Thanks, Chris. Um, Dr. Mesmer had a question um, in the chat. It says, trustworthiness is a hot topic in AI human interfacing. Did you see any differences between the expert and novice player adoption of strategies that you think was caused by different trust held by those player groups? So that's a very good question. So as I mentioned, the expert players, I was expecting them not to follow the suggestions. They should, I was expecting them to do whatever they wanna do. But surprisingly, they followed the, the, the suggestions uh, um, and um, they, they at least they tried to follow. So um, that was a surprising point. So regarding difference between expert and novice players, we are still running the experiment with novice players. So we have uh, very few participants as of now. Uh, So I haven't processed the data for the novice players yet, Uh, but I'm expecting to see some difference, um, not because they prefer to follow or not to follow, but I believe expert players have the ability to follow because um, AI suggestions are a little bit aggressive, and uh, if you ask a, an expert player to train X Marines, they can just quickly do that because they will have the resources and they know what to do. But novice players may struggle a little bit, not because they prefer not to follow, but uh, because they don't have the gameplay knowledge to do that. So for that reason, there might be some difference, but I'm not sure if I can attribute that to trust issues. So um, it's a little bit difficult to study. So for that, we are planning to run a completely different study specifically for trust. And we would like to sort of identify the underlying causes of trust issues, not because they can't follow, but they don't want to follow. Awesome. Um, Does anybody have any other questions? We have time for about one or two quick questions. Oh, we have one in the chat. Okay. Um, Derek Millard said, along the lines of the behavior model that is the that is in development. Can you basically run the model in reverse and observe the opponent player and try to guess their overall strategy based on the opening strategies we already know? So uh, the the behavioral model uh, can take an input from the observable game state. Uh, So uh, we could take an input from what uh, we can observe regarding what opponent is doing and we can account for the decisions a little bit back in time. So we could combine the historical data as well. And we could perform a prediction about what the opponent is going to do in the future. So it's not purely based on opening strategies. So we can basically run it at any time during the gameplay. But uh, uh, 
you know, you can only predict so much uh, in, in the future, right? So you can predict maybe a minute ahead in the future. If you try to predict a little bit longer than that, your prediction accuracy will be a little bit low. However, in this specific application, we don't need such long-term prediction model. So as long as we know the player's next move, we can adjust our strategy based on that. And, you know, that will be sufficient for us in this particular application, at least. Awesome. Any, oh, okay. Dr. Mesmer has another question. Um, are you taking your results, leaving academia and joining the StarCraft professional leagues? Uh, no, uh, <laughs> I don't plan to leave academia or join the StarCraft professional leagues. Um, you know, I am not very good at playing that game at all, honestly. Uh, so um, I am planning to just stick in academia and just uh, design AIs that can uh, play the game better than myself, actually. <laughs> awesome. Mm. All right. If there are no further questions, I... We'll go ahead and say thank you oh, again. I got, oh, I got one. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, Sorry. Are these slides going to be available? So I shared the slides with Amelia. So um, um, she can um, forward you if you um, uh, ask for her. Um, also, I think the recording will be available somewhere in yep. uh, yep. some platform. Cool. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. All right. With that, I will thank you. And everyone have a awesome rest of your day. Thank you again. Thank you so much. I appreciate uh, for uh, inviting me and it was a, uh, it was a nice audience. Thank you so much. Thank you, Emra. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for watching the latest installment in the Mesmer Research Group guest speaker series. We really hope you enjoyed it. For more information about our research group or how to get involved, please check us out at uah.edu slash MRG. We can also be found on LinkedIn and don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more videos like this one.